Newton's law of universal gravitation marked the boundary between prescience and science. Not only did he solve the driving question of natural philosophy, that is, why do planets move the way they do, but he unified the heaven and earth. Specifically, he recognized that the force that pulls an apple towards the Earth is the same physical force that keeps the moon revolving around the Earth. Along the way, he invented dynamics, in particular, the language needed to describe centripetal motion. Prior to Newton, people assumed that things were made of various elements on the Earth, and that celestial bodies had some fundamentally different composition, something that was not one of the elements. You might have heard of the four-element model of ancient Greek, with uh, things having the par particular uh, expressions of earth and water and air and fire, but things in the heavens did not move the same way. Things on earth move linearly. They move up and down or side to side, but things in the heavens move around. They circle. And so dating all the way back to Aristotle, there was assumption of something called quintessence or the fifth element, a thing that was different, that planet, that heavenly objects were made of that had a fundamentally different nature than that on earth and could not be understood in the same terms. And Newton said, no, that's not really true. There's sort of a famous story, which is probably apocryphal, that people have this image of Isaac Newton sitting under a apple tree and getting hit on the head by a falling apple and saying, ah, gravity, as if one of the smartest people who ever lived had not noticed that things fall until they got hit by it. But the apocryphal story probably comes from a thing which was mentioned, I believe, in the Principia, or at least in the biography of Newton soon after, uh, that he was sitting in his, on his farm and saw the moon rise over an apple orchard and realized that the force that was keeping the moon in orbit around the Earth was the same as the force that pulled the apples to the ground. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Consider for the moment you have the Earth and you have an apple. Well, you have, let's not have the apple. Let's have the moon. And the moon is tracking out a circle around the Earth whose radius is r from the center of the Earth and has some time t to go around, so it has some velocity, where the velocity is 2 pi times the radius over the period that goes around once. Of course, the time for the moon to go around the Earth once is pretty easy. It's one month, well, pronounced month, but it's one month, which is 27.3 days. And so we can figure out what is the acceleration that the Earth that the moon would need to have. Well, Newton, having invented dynamics, understands that there is centripetal motion, and he needs uh, v squared over r using this bit. He's able to turn that into this, and finds that the acceleration it takes to go around the Earth centripetally would be something like 0 0.00273 meters per second square. He also has his universal gravitation law. And he says, well, the acceleration that the Earth would produce on the moon would have them. We'd have in the gravitational law that the mass times the acceleration is the mass times the acceleration. All right. Or that the force, right, F net equals MA, is equal to the gravitational force, his universal gravitation thing, and then cancel the M's. All right. Let's clean that up back up again. So the acceleration that it would require for something to go around the Earth in that, at that radius, um, the force would produce an acceleration that is this, g times the mass of the Earth over the distance squared. Remember, he, he had a value for this. He did not have a value for, um, for m by itself, but that's okay. And that turns out to be 0, 0, 00269 meters per second squared which agree to within 1.5%, which is pretty good based on 1684 data. To be fair, Newton, then the reason the apple comes in this at all is that rather than having that, he really, of course, had that m of moon times the acceleration would be mg, and g could give us these. This is for the apple. So he's able to get a value of g times mass of the Earth from watching apples fall. Anyway, it's a pretty good agreement. This is what makes Isaac Newton the poster child for the scientific revolution. It's this amazing uh, thing that just falls out of his dynamics, and we'll see in a second is even more impressive when he loops back into Kepler. One of key Newton's key results was the description of centripetal motion. All right. Consider a satellite of mass m follow orbiting the sun, whose mass is m sub sun, at a distance r. And the time that it takes the planet to orbit the sun once is capital T. 
For simplicity, we're going to treat the motion as circular, even though we know it's really elliptical. The analysis is more involved, but ends up in the same place when you include ellipses. Newton worked from ellipses and did some really bravado uh, classical geometry. He was able to involve calculus because he was in the bu business of inventing it at the moment. So he was able to do some really impressive uh, planar geometry to get the same results, but it doesn't add anything. The circular motion bit is all of the important bit, and the elliptical stuff was basically corrections to that. To move in a circle, the planet must have an, an acceleration towards the sun oops, of my, right, whose magnitude is, as we said before, a sub c, which is this thing, which is really v squared over, uh, the whole thing is really just v squared over r. But remember that v is going to be 2 pi r over t. And so we end up with this, 4 pi squared over t squared all times r. But that acceleration is being produced by the gravitational force that he's talked about. And Newton's second law connects them that gmm over r squared, the gravitational force, has to be equal to the mass times the acceleration by Newton's second law. But the acceleration we know has to be this. And so we end up with r cubed over t squared when we solve these over. We bring an r squared up this way, and we get r squared over t squared, r cubed over t squared is g times the mass of the sun over 4 pi squared. And of course, all of those things are essentially constant. So that's Kepler's third law. In other words, Kepler's third law just falls out of the Newtonian analysis. You don't even have to try. It's only two lines of algebra. Um, this is spectacularly impressive to people. This solves a 50-year problem, and it solves it almost accidentally, almost contemptuously. Newton's like, oh yeah, my stuff just happens to produce the thing that nobody's been able to do f for five decades. Uh, and it's why he's recognized as sort of the savant of, of Europe at that point. All right, some applications. Consider an object that is orbiting the Earth or other, ob other gravitational body in a circular orbit with radius r and speed v. Since the centripetal force must be provided by the gravitational force, we have that mv squared for r is g times mass of the Earth times m over r squared. And playing around with this and canceling the m's that are the same, we get that the velocity must be the square root of g times the mass of the Earth over r. This is called the Keplerian speed for that orbit. Anything circling due only gravity will have that speed. This is historically how uh, Huygens was able to show that the rings of Saturn were not the disks of Saturn. People had it was unclear in early telescopes whether they were actually rings or whether they were solid bands. And Kep Huygens was able to show that they did not, parts of them did not move at the right velocities, and therefore they were non Keplerian, or they, they moved according to Keplerian curve, so they were not solid. Um, when we do rotations, we'll talk a little bit more about what it would have liked if they were, would have looked like if they were solid. But the key thing is that they move according to this Keplerian motion. Um, a more modern application is if you look out at galaxies out in the universe, they are have stars orbit around them. For instance, the Earth, right? We have the Milky Way, and the Earth is, well, going around the sun, and the sun is at some point, and they're all orbiting like this. Um, and when people look at what are called the rotation curves for galaxies, they find that it does not follow the square root curve. The Keplerian curve would be something like this, but in fact, for most galaxies, it looks more flat, which indicates to us that it's not like there's one or even large central object like we expect, but there must be mass everywhere. A lot of it is not visible and is so-called dark, so we get dark matter. And it's probably the strongest evidence for dark matter is these galaxy rotation curves, which are non-Keplerian, uh, where they should be. Somewhat different application. Recall that Kepler's third law connects the rays of an orbit to its period. We can solve that over uh, to say that r is the cube root of gme over 4 pi square all times t square. Uh, we derived this for something orbiting the sun, but since all the force laws are the same, it works for any central gravitational object. So I've just put the mass of the Earth in. It works for any period. So let's say what would happen if the period was a day. Then we would put one day, which is 86,000 something seconds, into here with all the other numbers, and we get about 42,200 kilometers, or 42 million meters. All right? And a satellite this orbit is said to be ge geosynchronous. Geosynchronous, yeah. Uh, since it has the same orbital period as the surface of the Earth. 
right? Geo meaning Earth and synchronous meaning same time. Why would anyone care? That's a good question always. Because anything on Earth also goes around once in a day. So if there were a satellite at this radius and it's directly overhead, it would stay directly overhead. It would rotate exactly as fast as you do. It would be geostationary. Now, I'm sort of cheating a little bit because if it was directly overhead the equator, then it will orbit in the same time. If it's And it will stay, appear to be stationary. It will stay directly overhead. If you're over any other point, then the orbit is inclined to the equator and it will not rotate. It will take one day, but the point that it's overhead is not moving the same direction as moving so they don't stay in sync. In other words, if you sort of imagine here's the equator, a thing which is directly over the equator stays directly over the equator as the Earth rotates. But a thing which was not directly over the equator would be tracking out an orbit like this and the Earth would spin under it. So you would get, it would take 24 hours to get back to where it was, but the point below it would not be the same all the time. Geostationary orbits have a lot of important applications. For instance, the satellite always has the same face of the Earth in view, which is really useful when you're doing things like weather monitoring, because you don't have to correct for the rotation of the Earth, you can just stare down. If you've ever seen these satellite pictures, they're basically stationary pictures of the Earth, which is nice. Since it's always the same apparent location in the sky, you can build a fixed antenna that can receive from it. So if anyone has a direct TV or dish network sat uh, satellite dish, you know that they're just dishes that you mount. They don't have motors. They don't track the satellites or anything like that. They just point to the south. In fact, the sort of 21st century Boy Scout kind of thing, like people say you could find which way is north in a forest by seeing where the moss grows. You can say which way is north, which way is south in a city by looking for where the satellite dishes on bars point. They will point towards the, the equator or towards the south. Um, the real estate at 42,000 kilometers is actually quite valuable in 21st century uh, for use in telecommunications and weather and surveillance. It's a really important orbit. It's actually getting quote unquote full. There's a lot of junk up there and is now heavily regulated to launch things into it because we need it.